morning, Avalon Beach Church. Welcome. What a glorious day we have again. I wonder if you would stand with me. Let's open with prayer this morning. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come in Jesus' name. And Lord, we are ready for you to move with the power that comes from the authority of that name. Lord, last week we looked at hallowed be your name, holy be your name. We cry out for that to be true today. And Lord, we're so thankful that we get to be here. Lord, I pray that the person who feels the farthest from you today would know the power of your grace to be swept up into your arms and loved Lord, I pray for your healing power today. Lord, I pray for freedom today. And Lord, I pray most of all, Lord, that somebody might know the power of forgiven sin today. So Lord, here we are. We're ready to worship you and we ask in Jesus' name for your spirit to move. And we pray all of this in the matchless and holy name of Jesus. And God's people said, I'll tell you what, you can remain standing if you want to. We're going to worship, and I am so excited about today. One of my great friends, and man, we have had some awesome times together in ministry. Terry Buckner is here to lead us. How many of you know about Cowtown? Anybody been there? A long, long time ago, back in the 90s, Terry and I led services in the rodeo arena on Sunday nights at Cowtown. We had the chance to minister together in church. I'm so thankful for him. Would you welcome Terry Buckner?
Raids in the garden.
He's far above every power and principality in the air. And we have the privilege, according to Ephesians, to be seated with him. And so, Lord, I pray that every person here today would know that joy, that power, that perspective of being seated with the Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray today that every one of us would know his love, his grace, his healing, and freeing, delivering power and, Lord, we would know what it means to have all of our sins washed away. So, Lord, we come to you for that and for each week left this season until Labor Day weekend. Thank you for this privilege, we pray in Jesus' name. Uh, before I begin, I also want to welcome and invite you guys just to lift up your hands. If you're here from Sharptown, United Methodist Church, just lift up your hand. This is a church right adjacent to Cowtown. I had the privilege of pastoring this church for five years as I began my ministry. And I'm just so thankful for the friendship and relationship that I continue to have. Bless you guys. Thanks for coming. This summer, our theme has been, Lord, teach us to pray. And we've looked at that passage in the Gospel of Luke where the disciples are watching Jesus pray. And it just grabbed my heart as I was preparing for this summer that when they watched him pray, they longed to be able to pray like he did. I don't find it anywhere in the Gospels where they said after Jesus healed somebody, Lord, teach me to heal like that. I don't find them saying when he delivered someone from demons, Lord, teach me to deliver like that. When he preached that message on the mountain, I didn't hear them say, Lord, teach me to preach like that. But when they saw him pray, they said, Lord, we got to know how to do that. We want that intimacy that you have with the Father. And so Jesus gave them a prayer, a model prayer. But they weren't asking for something just to memorize and then pray just from memory without even any feeling sometimes. They weren't asking for the intimacy that he had with God the Father. And the beautiful thing that Jesus prays in John 17, he prays that we would have that intimacy. He wants you to have it. He wants me to have it. In fact, in John 17, he says this, Father, what I have in you and you have in me, I want them to have in us. That's just so amazing. That's the heart of Jesus. What he has with the Father he wants us to have with the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And so I believe with all my heart that this prayer that he taught us, the Lord's Prayer, is a way to get that, to have that kind of intimacy. And so we've been looking at some phrases. We started out with our Father, and then we moved to who art in heaven. Last week we looked at hallowed be your name. And this week, we're going to focus on your kingdom come. I'll tell you what, I am so pumped about this message. I believe there's life-changing power in this prayer, your kingdom come. Now, here's how I want to begin. I'm not going to use that scripture in Luke. I want to begin with the first 15 verses in the Gospel of Mark. Now, I don't know whether you've ever noticed this, but Mark likes to get things done fast. And the other gospel writers take some time in the begin beginning to build a foundation. Mark just dives in head first. And one of his favorite words, you're going to hear it a couple of times in this first chapter. One of Mark's favorite words is immediately. And so I'm going to read it pretty fast. Because Mark likes to move fast. So listen to the first 15 verses of Mark chapter 1. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophet Isaiah, see I am sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. 
he proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than me is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens opened and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, Thou art my beloved Son, with thee I am well pleased. The Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness forty days, tempted by Satan. And he was with wild beasts, and the angels ministered to him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of God, and saying, Now, I have to slow down here. Because you're about to hear the first words uttered from Jesus in the Gospel of Mark. I was reading some commentary by Frederick Bigner on this passage. And he said, all of heaven is waiting breathlessly for what Jesus will say. Bigner writes, even the ants on earth drop their crumbs. <laughs> the first words of Jesus. Listen. The time is fulfilled. And the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. The time is at hand. And the kingdom of God is here. Repent and believe the gospel. The first words of Jesus. Now, if you've studied the New Testament, you know that one of the most often repeated words from the lips of Jesus is kingdom. He talks more about the kingdom of God than anything else in his ministry. It's his recurring theme, the kingdom. And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. And I will remind you that in the prayer that he taught us to pray, he says, Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. And I want to try to explain to you with the best of my ability exactly what that means. And I want to use five C words because that's what preachers do. So here are the words I'd like you to remember. First, chronology. Then second, confusion. Third, clarity. Fourth, counterfeit, and fifth, culmination. That's my outline. Let's begin with chronology, order. And I gotta tell you, man, I've been preaching since I was 20 years old. I'm just about 60, headed there. And I've never heard this before this week as I studied for this message. And I gotta tell you where I found it because this, has, it, this guy's becoming my favorite Bible teacher. And if you can use the internet, you can find all kinds of free Bible study, Bible information from this guy. His name is David Pawson, P-A-W-S-O-N. He's from England, so I could really just listen to him read the phone book. He's got a great voice. But I'll tell you what, I am learning so much from David Pawson, and I recommend him highly. This is what he writes. Let us start with the Old Testament. Listen, Israel was a kingdom before she had a place and before she was a people because the power of God came upon her. Let me just say that again. Israel was a kingdom before she had a place and even before she was a people because Israel experienced the power of God. Let me just remind you of how it went. Israel 
experienced the power of God when they were nobodies, when they were in bondage, when they were slaves to the empire of Egypt. They experienced the power of God. That came first in the plagues, in the power, in the miracles of God that ultimately set them free from their bondage, their slavery. They knew the power of God. It was after that that God began, began to give them rules to live by which knit them together as a people. The commandments, some boundaries on how they would live, that's what set them apart. That's what helped them to become the people of God. And then it was after that, that God gave them a place, helped them to enter into the promised land. And so Boston says the chronology, the order is important to understand kingdom. It's power, then people, and then place. That was the order for the Israelites. Now I hope you'll see when we get to the end of this message that that's exactly what we need to know to help us understand the kingdom of God for us today. Chronology matters. Power, people, place. Now, if you've studied the Bible, you understand there's a lot of confusion regarding the kingdom of God. In fact, God set it up for him to be Israel's king, but the people of Israel came to a place where they wanted their own human king like everybody else. We want to be like the other nations. And God relented, and they got Saul, who should have been awesome. He fit the profile. But it turned out he was had some wickedness inside of him and rebelled against God. David was anointed to be king by God, but we even see some brokenness in David, even though he did become the model that Jesus would, would follow and take his throne. And then after David, Solomon, I mean, he's wise, but he messes up a whole lot, but it only gets worse after Solomon, right? I mean, we do have some wonderful spots like when Josiah became king and there was revival in Israel, but by and large, the rest of the story is pretty bleak. It's a slippery slope of kings that continually rebel against God in wickedness and sinfulness. And so when Jesus is born, they've come from men dark days of nothing with God. 400 years of silence and the prophecy concerning Jesus to Mary is that she's going to have a son. They'll name him Jesus, which means Savior. And he will establish a kingdom on David's throne that will never end. He will establish the kingdom on David's throne that will never end. But the confusion just continues, doesn't it? I mean, Herod's confused when he hears that a baby is going to be born that's going to be king. And Herod thinks, oh my goodness, he's going to take my puny little throne. And so David had, or Herod has babies killed to try and get this baby before he can become king and take Herod's throne. He's confused about what kingdom Jesus will bring to the earth. The crowds around Jesus are confused. When he feeds, man, maybe 5,000 men, maybe 15 to 20,000 people in total, they try to make him king by force. Because they're thinking he can feed us. That's the kind of kingdom we want. And so Jesus has to move away from them because they're going to try to make him king by force. John the Baptist even gets confused when he's in prison. And has to ask, what kind of kingdom are you really bringing if I'm here ready to die in prison? There's just a whole bunch of confusion. On Palm Sunday, they're singing hosannas, but by Friday, they're yelling with hatred, crucify him. And then the Israelites, listen to this, the Israelites actually say, 
we don't have any king but Caesar. Come on. Really? God's people saying we don't have any king but Caesar? There's just so much confusion. Even after the resurrection, the disciples in Acts 1 are saying, is it going to happen now? Are you going to bring your kingdom now to Israel so we can get our place as number one in the land again? There's just a whole lot of confusion. And you know what? That continues to persist today. Chronology, order matters. Power, people, place. Confusion, rampant all through scripture and still today. But there is clarity. And if we would simply listen to Jesus, we would have more clarity on the kingdom of God. Jesus taught us about the kingdom more than anything else. He said things like, the kingdom of God is. And then he said, like a mustard seed. Starts small but grows big. The kingdom of God is. Like yeast. It works its way until it affects the whole loaf, silently working. And maybe this, the most clear thing of all, the kingdom of God is at hand. That's what he said in Mark 1.15, his first words. The kingdom of God is at hand, that means it's here. And what did he mean by that? He's here. And his power is here. And so every time he healed someone, the finger of God and the kingdom of God. Every time he delivered someone, the kingdom of God. Every time he enabled someone's sins to be forgiven, the kingdom of God. Why? Because power comes first. And when the power of God is displayed, his kingdom is here. And so we get this clarity from Jesus. We also get some clarity like this. He said, it's hard for the rich to enter in. Easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Jesus said, it's hard for the self-righteous, the Pharisees, the religious people, the ones who think they can make it on their own, self-righteous. It's hard for them to enter in. He also said things like this, it's hard for the busy to enter in. Remember his parables? Man, I can't come to the banquet because I've got this to do and I've got this person to bury and we've got family coming and so I'm not sure I can make it. It's hard for the busy to enter into the kingdom. But he did say this, if you come humbly like a child, then you found the pathway into the kingdom. And the kingdom is at hand because the power of God is here in Jesus Christ. Power, people, place. Remember he said this, some of you, and he looked out at real people like us, and he said some of you won't die until you see the kingdom come. Remember when he said that? What did he mean? Pentecost is coming, the power of God you're going to see the kingdom come with power when I release my Holy Spirit onto you. Power. Kingdom. That's the first move of God. And so Jesus gives us clarity on the kingdom. Now, the troubling thing for many of us is that his kingdom is not the only kingdom on this earth. There's a counterfeit kingdom that is a kingdom of darkness. Don't you find it interesting that when Satan comes to tempt Jesus and he says, listen, if you'll just bow down to me, I'll give you the kingdoms of this world. And Jesus doesn't go jersey on him in sarcasm. He doesn't do any, he doesn't disagree. He doesn't say, what are you talking about? You'll give me the kingdoms of this world. You know why he didn't do that? 
because there are counterfeit kingdoms under the authority of the evil one, under Satan, kingdoms of darkness, kingdoms of disease, kingdoms of disobedience, kingdoms of death. The Bible says that the enemy, Satan, is the God of this world. It also says that he's the prince of this world and that he's the ruler of this world. And what we should take from that is a clear understanding that along with the kingdom of God that has come with power already, the power has created a people called the church. Along with the kingdom of God, there are counterfeit kingdoms under the rule and authority of the evil one. Counterfeit kingdoms of darkness. And because of that, we who have experienced the power of God, and we who have become in the church the people of God, are living in direct opposition to other kingdoms. We are, as Charles Colson wrote in one of his books, kingdoms in conflict. And when you came to know Christ, you didn't get a ticket to the love boat, you got a ticket to a battleship. We are kingdoms now in conflict. tell them old when I use references that anybody under 30 has no clue about. But I scanned the crowd and I'm pretty safe. <laughs> we are on a battleship. And we are in a kingdom that's in direct conflict with the kingdoms of darkness. Now, the fifth word. Chronology, confusion, clarity, counterfeit, culmination. This is what we are looking towards. The power of God has come in Jesus, and many of us have experienced it when we were born again. The power of God washing away our sin. There are some here that I know about that have experienced the power of God in healing, in restoration, from brokenness, in relationships. The power of God has come, that's first. You have been baptized into the people of God. And now, the people of God are awaiting that third level of the kingdom, the place, the culmination of all of creation. We are awaiting that day when Jesus will burst through the clouds in triumph on a white horse written on his thigh, King of kings and Lord of lords. That day is coming, amen? amen? We're waiting for that day. That day is coming. I believe some of you will disagree with this, but I believe that he will establish a literal millennial reign, thousand-year reign on this earth. I've decided that I'm going to let the Bible say what it means and mean what it says. And in Revelation, it describes a thousand-year reign. I think he's coming back, and he will establish himself as the king of the earth. And through his authority, the glory of God will cover this earth as the waters cover the sea. That's what we're waiting for. And at the culmination of that thousand-year reign, he will take the kingdoms of this earth and offer them back to his Father, who will then let heaven descend upon this earth, and heaven and earth will be joined as a new heaven and a new earth. That's what we're waiting for. The power of God has created a people of God, and one day there will be a place like Eden again, a fully restored, fully redeemed earth with heaven there. Hallelujah. Man, that is the kingdom of God. 
And here's my question. You may have prayed the prayer all of your life. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. But I got to ask you, I'm a good son. My father taught me as a preacher that a preacher's job is to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. Have you ever experienced that prayer? Has the kingdom come to you? Have you experienced the power of God in your life that cleanses you from all sin? That is the kingdom coming. The power of God in you that cleanses you from all sin. Have you experienced that? Have you been baptized into the people of God? The rich have a hard time. The self-righteous have a hard time. The busy have a hard time. But the humble who come like children can enter in. Have you experienced the kingdom? His power in your life. Have you experienced the kingdom being baptized, initiated into the people of God? Because if you haven't, you are not in a position to experience the place that's coming after his reign on this earth when the Father brings heaven down and there's a place for us. Let me tell you this. Satan may be the God of this world, but that's not my kingdom. He may be the prince of this world, but he's not my prince. He may be the ruler of a counterfeit kingdom on this earth, but that's not where I live. And the gospel message that Jesus declared in his first words, the kingdom of heaven is here. Repent and believe the gospel. You see, this is my father's world. And it's not the enemy's. And in order for us to live in that reality, we have to know the power of God in new birth. We become citizens of the only true kingdom, the one that will last for eternity. And man, the thing that I want more than anything else in my life is to spend the rest of my days calling people into that kingdom. Have you experienced the prayer, Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. That can happen right here today with the power of God releasing you from the bondage and slavery of your sinfulness. Would you stand with me now? And I'd like you to just bow your heads, close your eyes. When God comes, the kingdom comes. It's here. It's now. And it's culminating in one day soon. And I just want to ask, man, if you want to come into relationship with Jesus and have your sins forgiven, you want to recommit yourself to him today and while our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed would you just lift up your hand and I'll pray for you anybody I want to come back yes thank you I want to come into relationship with Jesus or back into relationship with Jesus I want to be in his kingdom not a counterfeit one anybody else let's pray together Heavenly Father 
Your kingdom is at hand here today. And Lord, together we repent and believe. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that for every one of us today and this week, you would surprise us with signs of your kingdom that show us what's coming in fullness one day. Would you release the power of God in our lives? Help us to stand with the people of God and look toward the place of God's kingdom flooding this earth like the waters cover the sea. Come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. Move in our lives today. Lord, I thank you so much for these men and women, families, teenagers, young people, children. Lord, would you help us to be in this world but not of it? Citizens of a kingdom that's coming in fullness one day. And I pray this with all the power that comes with Jesus, all of his authority, all of his love, all of his grace. I pray this in Jesus' name. God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for coming. Lord bless you. Have a kingdom of weakness. Bless you. Thank you.